It is February, and in America that means it's Black History Month. So we're taking a look at modern and historical black mixologists who've made important additions to the world of cocktail craft. Unfortunately, that means we can't take a look at a lot of these things without eventually discussing the issues of racism and how it has negatively impacted black mixologists from being able to establish themselves as prominent members of this craft. Unfortunately, there is no better person to discuss with regards to this event than Louis Deal on today's episode of Mike's Hard Reviews. Give me a, a moment to steal myself because I'm um, probably gonna get angry at some point. I'm kind of already angry about this. Hey there, hello there, my name is Michael. Welcome back to Mike's Hard Reviews. I'm a bartender from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and it's lovely to have you guys all here today. Today we'll be talking about a black mixologist from the early uh, late 1800s, turn of the 20th century, named Louis Deal, um, who unfortunately, I have to say a caveat, there's not a lot of history about personally. A lot of the history surrounding Louis Deal revolves around his time at the Atlas Hotel in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is only extending from a period from 1892 to 1893, and is unfortunately a textbook perfect example of overt racism preventing members of the black community from entering the world of mixology post-reformation after the Civil War in America. Let's sort of set this all up though, because we need to discuss a couple of things that lead to us documenting Lewis and his work, um, or rather, the lack thereof because he was omitted from the business. This all starts in 1892, when a man named Frank Beck opens the Atlas Hotel in Cincinnati, Ohio. It wasn't much of a hotel, according to reports it had 18 rooms, and therefore wasn't much of a hotel, but it did have a very nice and ornate bar room, which was decorated very well and very well stocked. That, in combination with the fact that it was close to Cincinnati's, at the time, very recently constructed new city hall, meant that it was a natural place for business to migrate to. And in the first day that it was open, Open, the bar served 3,000 people. That's a huge number even by today's standards. I don't think I've come even remotely close to, to serving 3,000 people in a single service, but wow. Round of applause for that, holy shit. <laughs> now, despite this success, Frank Beck had a couple of problems with the bar, most specifically the fact that his head bartender at the time had a habit for, as he puts it, neglecting his duties. Frank Beck fires him and instead replaces him with Louis Deal. At the time, Lewis was working as a waiter in the bar, not as one of its bartenders, auxiliary or otherwise. I find that odd because history denotes that Lewis had been a bartender previously, but there's no record of exactly where or how that happened. His history sort of starts at this point where he is promoted from waiter to head bartender. Despite the fact that Frank Beck has strong conviction that this is a good idea, and there's a lot of evidence to back it up, Frank himself saying that, hold on, Frank himself, in an interview with the Cincinnati Inquirer at the time, stated, Deal did his work better and more satisfactory than any man who had ever held the position. So long as he did his duty, I intend to keep him where he is. He stood by Lewis Deal and his skill. In the year that they had been open prior to this change being made in 1893, Lewis had shown that he was a skilled worker, dedicated to what he did, and was willing to get the job done properly. People liked him. Frank liked him, and Frank understood that he had the skill and the prowess to get into this job and do it well. Unfortunately, Cincinnati didn't necessarily agree with him. You see, the reason why that interview was held was because Louis Deal was black, Frank was white, and most of Frank's clientele at the Atlas Hotel were also white. So the Cincinnati Inquirer was there because it was an odd thing to see a black man be promoted to head bartender at what was considered a first-class establishment in the city of Cincinnati. And I'm starting to get a little angry. Whew. After Lewis is promoted to this position, regardless of the fact that he is clearly deserving of it, and there is a lot of evidence to back that statement up, white bartenders in Cincinnati instigate a boycott amongst the clientele of the Atlas Hotel because Deal has taken this position. It's a difficult time. It's a heavy thing to have to deal with as a business owner, and especially as somebody who stands by their actions of allowing a black man to hold this position that a lot of people saw as important in not just the area of Cincinnati, but America overall. Despite the fact that a lot of his clientele are no longer appearing at the Atlas Hotel, 
Lewis is still the head bartender, and Frank holds out for quite a while before eventually being sat down by a bartender named George Bear and given an ultimatum. Now, if you don't know the name George Bear, good. He's a piece of human fucking shit. But let's give you a little primer on him. George Bear at the time was the head bartender of what was then a prestigious hotel named the Gibson House, which was opened in 1849. And if you need any notion of what kind of place this was, much like the St. Louis Country Club, this establishment was used as an internment camp for German Americans in World War II. And very clearly, based on that fact, does not have a strong proclivity towards being on the right side of moral affairs. George is the head bartender at the Gibson House, and he sits down with Frank Beck and gives him an ultimatum. A week has passed since Lewis has taken this position. George sits down with Frank and tells him, look, if you don't remove Lewis from this position, prominent bartenders in the area of Cincinnati, Ohio, will issue 100,000 flyers stating that you have hired a colored man, his words, not mine, as the head bartender in a first-class establishment, and they will distribute those to anyone who is willing to read them throughout the city. Essentially, he is threatening to blow up the scale of this affair to not just the entire city, but potentially the entire state and the entire nation as a whole, because a black man was allowed to bartend at this establishment. Two days pass, and then Frank removes Lewis from the head bartender position, not firing him. He returns to his position as a waiter, and someone replaces him as a head bartender. Who that person is, nobody knows, and nobody will probably ever know because the Atlas Hotel would close within two months and then be sold at auction shortly thereafter. This whole affair takes place in less than the span of a month. Um, it is quick and dirty and disgusting and a violent, horrifying example of how white supremacy will ruin anything. And I say that knowing fully well that George Bear defended his position on this by stating that he was not a racist, an overt lie, but rather that the issue he had with black men holding this position was that there were too many good men, white men specifically, waiting for situations to permit them to enter this business for a colored man to be allowed in first. Obviously, that is an incredibly disingenuous argument because for one, black men, especially freed black men, post-Civil War were considerably more in need of efficient and well-made jobs, good, skilled labor, which is what mixology was considered as at the time. But also, how is it not racist to state that white people deserve better than black people, despite the fact that they both have a need for something? George Bear is long dead. I have no idea what happened to him after this, this whole event happened, but I hope that he is rotting in an unmarked grave somewhere, no family has carried his name, and that somebody digs him up, fucks his corpse, and throws it in the Ohio River. In any case, that's kind of where the story ends. Lewis is removed from the head bartender position, the Atlas Hotel closes, is sold at auction, and the trail goes cold from there. What could have been the most important and influential action that would have led to Lewis's career being made and him becoming a documented and well-respected member of the mixology culture historically was snubbed out by overt racism. And the thing is, George Bear maintained he was not a racist. And if you believe that, you can believe that. I think you're full of shit, but you can believe that. The thing is, everybody who was doing this alongside George Bear very clearly was not, well, not a good person. Let's just put it that way. As a matter of fact, to speak verbatim about this and these events post their occurrence, white bartenders in the city of Cincinnati who were present at the protest of Louis Steele taking his position would state that it was an overt, intolerable insult to white men working in the position. That is just racism, straight up. You're offended by the fact that a black man can do a better job at your job than you, so you attempt to snub out his chance to do so by threatening an institution for hiring him in the first place. All of that pivots around the fact that he's black. Fuck all of these people, I know they're all dead, but fuck all of these people and the horrible thing that they did to Mr. Deal. Aside from just being angry at a camera, 
for this entire episode. I do want to give you guys a notion that this is actually a documented, like, sociological thing. And what I'm about to say is not an original thought of mine. This is uh, sort of an analysis that a lot of modern doctors and writers and sociologists have encountered when discussing white supremacy and how it oppresses members of minority groups in societies where white supremacy is not rooted out. The idea, in essence, is that um, the oppressor never forgets what the oppressed is capable of, no matter how much they try to make the oppressed forget it themselves. Um, I don't have a really good, concise way to put this into um, a single a single thought. So I'm going to play a TikTok that expresses it uh, very clearly, uh, featuring uh, both Cat Williams, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Lamont Hill, and Donnell Wrights uh, from TikTok. And I'm gonna let it play in its entirety. You can find a link to it in the description down below. Um, but I wanna share this with you because it illustrates this concept beautifully. Think about the parallels in the videos I'm about to show you. One is by comedian, actor, and writer, Cat Williams. You probably wonder, why do white people pay so much attention to black people if they don't like them? I don't pay attention to things I don't like. What's the answer? The liar knows what lie he told. You see what I'm saying? So even if I made it deceitful and I made you think that the answer's over here, but the answer is really over here, I'm still going to be looking over here. Me, the one that tricked, because I know this is the right answer. Black people have lost their identity, but our oppressors have not lost our identity. And the others by journalist, professor, and activist Dr. Mark Lamont Hill. That's why these writers kept writing written by himself, written by herself, Phyllis Wheatley, Frederick, D because they thought Negroes couldn't read and write. They thought Negroes didn't have the capacity to read and write, and yet they made all the laws to stop us from learning how to do what? Read and write. If we can't read and write, what you trying so hard to stop us for? And the answer is because America has always known what you are. America has always known who you are. America has understood what you're capable of, and they will make you think you ain't nothing at the same time that they exploit your gifts. They'll tell you you lazy and make you a slave. They'll tell you you dirty and have you clean their house. They'll tell you you uncivilized, and we raise their children. They know who you are. But it's time that you listen to who you are. That you understand who you are. Two different phrasings, same idea. It addresses the lies told by white supremacy culture and how it benefits from the demonization and dehumanization of black people and black culture, while at the same time relying on black humanity and black culture. Love and liberation to you all. And as always, like and follow for more content. In essence, white supremacy culture understands that it is lying to the people it oppresses and needs to monitor the lie it's told to ensure it does not collapse. And that is exactly what is happening here. Because nobody had the issues with Louis Deal being a waiter or a porter or a laborer at the hotel, they had an issue with him holding a position that carried with it weight a position that would give him authority, a position that would give him power, a position that would give him respect. So they claim he's not worthy of it, and they scare tactic their way into removing him from that position, despite the fact that they understand his skill warrants him maintaining his original position, directly related to the one they did not want him in. Needless to say, Nobody knows what would have happened had Lewis been allowed to feature at the Atlas Hotel as the head bartender. Maybe he would have been as successful as his predecessors, John Dabney, and the successor, Tom Bullock. Uh, maybe the Atlas Hotel would have stayed open. Maybe had those flyers been released and published and given to every soul who would take one in a 30-mile radius, the abolitionist groups that were found only in the North even as small as they may have been post-Civil War, would have latched onto the Atlas and given it the support it needed. Or maybe people would have simply thought, what the fuck are all these crackers doing? Let's go support this business. And maybe Louis Steele would have been one of the most famous and important bartenders that we have ever known in cocktail history. But now, because of the institutional systematic racism that America was built on, We'll never know. Because we'll never know what kind of impact Lewis could have had on the world of mixology, 
There are no written records of his activities before or after this event. That includes where he was, when he was born, who his family was, when he died. None of it has been written down as far as I can tell. And that leaves me with no cocktail to share with you in this video. But considering that the circumstances, um, I would like to submit one of my own. One that I've been sitting on for a while and sort of struggling with the idea of presenting to you um, for a couple different reasons. I'm gonna make for you guys today a cocktail called the Rage. Um, it is a variation on a Bacardi cocktail featuring rum, lemon juice, grenadine, and a pepper extract, which you can see me make in this episode of Spur of the Moment. Don't click away from this video yet. We have something to discuss. I understand that the content that I make is not inherently educational. A lot of what I do is based around entertainment and a niche hobby that most people engage with by throwing down their gullets and not giving a shit about the history or the people who came up with the delicious drink they're chugging. I understand that I am not the person, obviously, to sit here and discuss with all of you the horrendous issues that black Americans face in America to this day, despite the progress that has been made to humanize them and free them from enslavement. And moreover, to do away with the white supremacy culture that has allowed all of this to occur throughout all of American history. However, I had an awakening in March of 2020 after the gross murder of George Floyd by former police officer and current federal prisoner, Derek Chauvin. I was furious. I witnessed the murder of a man who did little more than supposedly pass a fake bill at a cash register, followed by the subsequent brutalization physically, emotionally, and psychologically, of anyone who would support him by the vast military complex that is the American policing system, which has actively and constantly, since its beginning foundations as slave hunters in America, sought to disenfranchise and destabilize black communities by over-policing and under-respecting them. The rage was born from the uncappable emotion I felt when here in Kalamazoo, after the murder of George Floyd, despite COVID lockdowns and curfews, I witnessed thousands of beautiful people go out in support of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Philando Castile, too many names to list here and stand with their fists in the air screaming Black Lives Matter and watching the police brutalize them with rubber bullets, metal batons, riot shields, and cowardly, pathetic, spineless racism. Since then, I have sat on this recipe. I have refined it to a point where I think it is truthfully what it should be. And I'm electing to share it with you today as a relevant connection to how I feel about the way Louis Deal was trounced upon by history and his collaborators of the time. And allow me to say too, um, if you have an issue with me addressing social problems like this uh, as a member of a business, that is inherently focused on creating social experiences and understanding and being able to communicate with people, uh, and as just a simply a, hu a good human being who does not want to see innocent people brutalized by police forces, if you're not comfortable with me as a member of an institution, an industry, that is all about making sure people are having a good time and is based on a lot of very important history that was almost all entirely lost and how history and racism have to be discussed in tandem because all of American history is racist, you can get fucked by a horse. If you have a problem 
with me coming on here and advocating for the justice of black people murdered by police in America or attempting to revive stories of black people who are not given proper respect and documented correctly in history and do my part to humanize black culture in this country that has done nothing but attempt to do the opposite, you can get fucked by a horse. As a matter of fact, actually, I hope a cop brutalizes you in the street. In a bit of tragic irony, I hope that if you think my advocacy here and my strong opinions about this are foolish or childish or whatever insulting thing you want to hurl at me, I hope a cop beats you halfway to death in the street and then arrests you for getting blood on his uniform. I hope you experience the same exact horrifying treatment that black Americans have faced forever, from enslavement to today. Because maybe then you will understand what it is like to be taken as a person, stripped from your humanity, and treated like property, as if you are an expendable number on a census. Fuck racists, let's make a rage. We'll start with three quarters of an ounce of grenadine, We'll come behind that with some lemon juice. One ounce of lemon juice. Half an ounce of a peppercorn tincture. You can learn how to make this in the description down below or by watching my video uh, from the Spur of the Moment series on a two pepper extract. One and a half ounces of a blended white rum. That's all of our ingredients. Let's go ahead and grab some ice. As always, we'll be sticking with one whole cube and one cube cracked. We'll go ahead and cap that up, tap it down. Give that shake the chill and dilute for 10 to 12 seconds. To serve this, I'm going to grab a chilled rocks glass from my freezer. I'm going to fill that up with some smaller ice. Go ahead and uncap our shaker and then double strain it over the ice. For a garnish, we'll go ahead and grab a lemon, cut a nice wheel from that. We'll take a cocktail pick and get some cherries ready. We're gonna use this lemon wheel and a cherry to make a flag, which is a piece of citrus wrapped around a cherry. Once we've got that all nicely put together, we'll rest that on the rim of the glass with our eyes. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a rage. So with our uh, station cleaned up, let's go ahead and um, give our rage a taste. But before we do, um, This drink is dedicated to the beautiful black souls snubbed from this world by America, its racism, and its crooked police. Black Lives Matter. It's a gentler version of a Bacardi cocktail with this very potent, intense peppercorn chili spice behind it. Um, the idea behind the flavor synthesis was the idea of this dynamic and constantly in flux blend of flavors from this tart, rich berry and lemon to the funky smoothness of the rum that from underneath all of that comes this welling heat, this welling sharpness and intensity as a synonym for anger. Anger at seemingly unbreakable systems of oppression that America was built on and will one day be its undoing. Fuck this stupid place. Black Lives Matter. Fuck you if you disagree.